So there's a recognition that our models are broken. Even Bob Kerslake said it. Uh, our regeneration models that we've used recently, our real estate models are broken. Uh, our planning models are broken. Uh, and the opportunity is for us to think slightly differently now. Um, in many ways, those, those models were based on this idea that we could set any, everything forth in some sort of perfect uh, regulatory system. This is Philip Howard's uh, Death of Common Sense statement. And um, this idea that we, we constantly need certainty, we've obsessed with certainty. And the statement he says, obsessed with certainty, we see almost nothing. And it's an interesting uh, phenomenon that we've gone through where the planning system is so determined to give us certainty. The trouble with the planning system, uh, as we draw it, as we do it, it's out of date. Uh, there's a couple of statements. Colin Powell's one is that uh, the battle plan never goes beyond the first bullet that's fired. And that's the problem with us doing things, is that the day we put pen to paper, it changes. And how do we respond to that when we are obsessed with certainty? And that's, there's a challenge in that whole, that whole exercise. And I've often said um, this whole thing about us moving towards giving absolute certainty, even our pursuit of design codes, do we actually really achieve what we set out to achieve by doing these? I'll come to that a bit later. The real problem with the planning system, um, it has two underlying anti-city movements, both, both based on very utopian ideals, the garden city movement and the modern city movement. And I think here li lies the problem. And I think the thinking that gave us both these, these principles are the ones that, um, that still drive our thinking, this idea, this obsession with, uh, with rationality. And um, Owen Hatterley in his book, uh, The New Ruins of Britain, if any of you have seen his book, it's worthwhile getting. It's, uh, it's, a, it's sort of an edict of what's happened, uh, in urban, particularly in urban Renaissance times. And he was actually saying that modernism, that was this great icon, this great way of thinking, this, this thing that was underpinned by, by um, social concerns, has really just become a shell. It's just become a paper exercise. And therefore, it's nothing more than style. And, challenge in urban design, have we just become a style exercise as well? Are we just playing with uh, constantly between Korea and Kohlhaas as our two, our two thinking models? So this idea that we've got time to think differently about how we do things at this point in time. And uh, I think this is where the urban design group has to play a role. I think, I think we can't be comfortable. We have to be unreasonable all the time. And uh, the suggestion is that's a good time to be unreasonable now. I also believe that we're in that perfect storm with that time where all our moons are aligned, that we can start thinking differently. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. Everything's moving towards bottom-up, everything from top down to bottom-up, whether it's the localism agenda, whether it's our economy, which is much more about business startups, or whether it's about uh, the expectation around our, uh, the way we deal with environmental issues. So all of a sudden we have these alignments of social, economic, environmental, and political, and the opportunity is for us to do things. When the hippies were around, they had agendas, but no one wanted to listen to them. I think in this particular instance, there's probably an opportunity to talk and be listened to. I believe that we're in this paradigm shift already. Okay, this paradigm shift, we don't have to wait to happen. It's going to happen, and it's happened already. And it's happened despite us, not because of us. So we tried, to, in thinking about this whole concept around massive small, we, we, th we thought about a theorem. And the theorem was, and it was really a reflection on the idea that we saw big master plans with big solutions and big names and big architects that the inverse was probably true, that the idea that the emergence of a, of a true urban life is probably inversely proportional to the bigness, bigness of the solution, or alternatively proportional to the number of massive small changes we make rather than one single or one or two big single changes. And Indira Gandhi wrote it quite well uh, when she said, you can break the big plan to small steps and take the first steps right away. In many ways, many of our plans haven't been able to take that first step, and that's the reason we have our 71 master plans in, in certain areas. So just coming back to thinking, just going back, it was interesting to see Christopher Alexander um, in, in your, your brochure. Uh, you know, I think the last remaining urban theorist out there, I can't think of anyone else left. You know, he pops off. Who's thinking about, uh, who's thinking about design? You know, who's thinking about David Abramovich's um, statement? So just going back to thinking about it, um, when you start looking at the question of complexity, I always thought that complexity was about the science of irregularities. But it's not, it's about the science of regularities. And the, the, the proof is that if you take, if you give an absolute freedom of choice, let's assume a squatter settlement, you have absolute freedom of choice to do whatever you want. People do the same things, okay? People, can, people conform in particular ways. So it's in many ways, an emergent system is very much a system which is about creating regularities. So this guy talks about it. I think you mentioned iPod in your statement up. Uh, statement us was it Einstein responsible for the iPod or was it Steve Steve uh, Jobs probably Einstein in some ways, but this idea of evolution not revolution that we constantly see revolution as the way forward 
And we never try and, we don't test things. We don't, we don't look to evolve different principles. And if you take emergent systems, um, emergent systems are about quite, quite, quite funny things that tend to happen. As I mentioned before, regularities get created um, quite quickly. So a flock of birds, a swarm of ants, the economy, the World Wide Web, all those things start developing quite simple rules quite quickly. They start developing hierarchies, they start building networks, fields, and the prospect is that if we did nothing, if we go back to this kind of statement, why don't we just sit back and let humans self-organize? Okay? Why have any rules? We'd actually achieve regularities quite quickly. So this idea that planning is not something that, that's um, that, that, that it's unexpected, it's something that will come as a natural process. And the reason we probably want that is we want order, and that's what society has always done. It's always, be, it's always been about creating order. And this is what Isha says about order, repetition of units. In other words, regularity comes out again as a key principle. Uh, chaos is multiplicity without rhythm. So we started looking at a series of what we call our fixes. And the first one was to try and see if we can move away from this old placemaking agenda, this idea that we all make places. I don't believe we make places. I think we create conditions. We the, I think your statement that you had in your, your, um, your uh, statement a bit earlier about condition making, creating the conditions. I think we create conditions as urbanists. Other people make places. And I think as soon as we move away from understanding that we condition making, not place making, I think we'll start thinking completely differently. So we started testing a, a series of ideas based on emergent principles um, that rules would emerge quite quickly, networks would form, fields would need to be created, default conditions would need to be made, and then the catalyst needed to be put in place. And we started developing these ideas. And I'll just take you through the one, just one particular example. Rules uh, are important, and I think rules are something that we can, we can focus on quite quickly. I'm going I'm to stop on this one because I think it's probably the most telling one. Uh, this is D. Hock who started Visa. Uh, simple, clear purpose and principles give rise to complex and intelligent behavior. Complex rules and regulations give rise to, to simple and stupid behavior. I challenge that design codes have created stupid behavior. And that's what I'll leave with you, leave with you today to talk about. Thank you.